Let's now apply the theory of optimum currency areas, which we discussed in a previous video. Let's apply it to the euro. Recall that the benefits of a common currency are a lower, more stable inflation rate, lower interest rates, and increased trade. Notice that these benefits applied most in Europe to the smaller periphery economies, to Portugal, to Ireland, to Greece, to Spain. They did not apply to Germany. Germany, for example, already had a low and stable inflation rate. They had low interest rates. And being one of the largest economies, they didn't need increased trade so much as the smaller economies. So Germany was in the euro for political reasons, not for economic reasons. And that would turn out to have implications later. The cost of the common currency, no independent monetary policy, and a lesser ability to respond to shocks. Let's take a closer look at these costs. So when are the costs of a common currency likely to be large? Well, remember, a key cost of having the same currency as another country is a reduced ability to respond to national shocks. So a key question is, how different are the size and correlation of shocks across different economies in the same common currency area? And for the case of the euro, the answer was very different. Not only, for example, are Greece and Germany very different sized economies, they are based upon different exports and imports, different industrial structures, different specializations, different wage and union structures. As a result, it would not be at all unexpected for Germany to be booming at a time when Greece was in recession or vice versa. So given that the shocks are going to be very different, how much control over the common monetary policy will individual countries have? And in the case of the euro, the answer was very little control for the periphery countries. Germany was likely to dominate. In part, this was by design. Germany had the best monetary policy to begin with. So everybody, in a sense, wanted it to dominate. But because of that, the European Central Bank was built from the beginning to respond less to shocks in the periphery countries. That has begun to change since the shocks have been so large and important, but one of the reasons the European Central Bank has been slow to respond is that it was built from the beginning not to take into account the shocks in other countries, the periphery countries in particular. So I said in the previous video that one way of responding to a shock was internal devaluation, a reduction in wages and prices. That response can be ameliorated or spread out through other means, such as labor mobility. So if wages have to fall in one part of the common currency area, for example, a way of spreading that shock out is for workers to move from where wages are low to move to where wages are high. Now, despite their best efforts, labor mobility in the European Union still remains relatively low. It's hard because of differences in language and culture to move from one country to another country. It's much easier in the United States, for example, to move from Texas to California or from California to Texas. So when California goes into a recession, say because of the dot-com bust, workers move out of California and into other states. Another way of ameliorating shocks is through fiscal equalization, is through spending money in the part of the country or the part of the common currency area where there's a recession. So when Texas goes into a recession, for example, because the price of oil falls, we don't think very much in the United States. It's not very controversial to spend a lot more on unemployment insurance in Texas. It's much more controversial in the European Union for Germans to spend money on unemployment insurance for Greeks. People in the United States think of themselves as Americans first and Virginians second. In the European Union, they think of themselves as Greeks first and Europeans second. So for both of these reasons, labor mobility and fiscal equalization, it's easier to have a common currency in the United States, namely the dollar, than it is to have a common currency across Germany and Greece. In recent years, economists have been critiqued for not predicting the financial crisis. And that's true. It's not true, however, that economists can't predict anything. In fact, many economists predicted that the euro was going to fail. Here's Milton Friedman speaking in 2000. Quote, I think the euro is in its honeymoon phase. I hope it succeeds, but I have very low expectations for it. 
I think the differences are going to accumulate among the various countries and that non-synchronous shocks are going to affect them. Right now, Ireland is a very different state. It needs a very different monetary policy from that of Spain or Italy. On purely theoretical grounds, it's hard to believe that it's going to be a stable system for a long time. If we look back at recent history, they've tried in the past to have rigid exchange rates, and each time it is broken down. 1992, 1993, you had the crises. So the verdict isn't in on the euro. It's only a year old. Give it time to develop its troubles. End quote. So I think you have to say that Milton Friedman nailed it on this question. Moreover, Friedman was not a lone genius on this issue. Paul Krugman, who comes from the opposite side of the political spectrum than Milton Friedman, also predicted that the euro wasn't going to last. Your fellow co-lecturer, Tyler Cowen, predicted that the euro would not do very well. In fact, a great many economists, based upon the theory of optimal currency areas, the theory we have been discussing, said and thought that the European Union was not an optimal currency area. And because it was not an optimal currency area, it was a mistake to adopt the euro and that adopting the euro was likely to cause big problems, exactly as has happened. Here are some places for further reading. The theory of optimum currency areas was launched by a Canadian economist, Robert Mondell. He would later win the Nobel Prize in economics for this and other work. A recent piece applying the theory of optimum currency areas to the euro crisis is by Paul Krugman. You can find this piece by Googling these words. You can also find by Google a fantastic debate between Milton Friedman and Robert Mundell from 2001. The debate was called One World, One Currency. Again, you can find that by Google. Thanks.